Welcome once again to Roundtable. I'm Bob Orr of the Press Club of Southwest Florida. And today we're looking at the very important topic of the January 6th attack on the U.S. Capitol. All of the political repercussions from that and also the new security concerns as we go forward towards the inauguration. We're happy today to welcome our special guest, the recently retired Florida Republican Congressman Francis Rooney. Congressman Rooney just finished up serving his second term representing the 19th District of Florida. Congressman, thanks for joining us today. Thank, thank you for having me on. I appreciate it. Also, a couple of intrepid journalists who were there covering the Capitol the day of the attack. Uh, Sophie Alexander from ITV News was actually right in the middle of that mob scrum as they broke into the building. Sophie, thank you for taking the time to join us. Hi, thanks very much for having me. And also Grace Seegers from CBS News. Grace was covering the Senate side at the time that the uh, riot took place. Grace, it's also Glad to have you on the roundtable panel. Thank you for having me. All right, with me, uh, Larry Doyle, longtime veteran CBS uh, producer. Larry, good to see you again. Thank you, Bob. And also Denise LeClaire Cobb, formerly of CNN. And Denise, if you do me the honors of leading us away, let's get started. Okay, thanks, Bob. Um, Congressman Rooney, it's been eight days since the riots at the Capitol, and now there are 15,000 plus National Guardsmen in DC Many of them are sleeping on the floor of the Capitol. What do you say now is the state of our democracy? And do you hold President Trump responsible? Well, let me start with the latter first. Yes, I do. I don't know if it's a prima facie legal case or not. We'll find that out. But certainly his words incited those people to go down there and exceed the bounds and go way beyond any rational behavior and, and pierce our, one of our most sacred government uh, institutional buildings, the Capitol. As far as where does that leave us? What is this saying to the world? You know, if you look at the wall in front of Lafayette Square and now you look at the Capitol, we're more locked down than, than Tehran, more locked down than Miraflores Palace in Caracas. Uh, we're supposed to be the beacon of openness, transparency, and democracy. And I think that's a little uh, upended right now. That's true. And it was a terrible day for our country. And Sophie, you were right in the middle of it. Your crew's uh, amazing report uh, is being talked about all over the world. You were the only TV crew literally embedded with the rioters as they breached the Capitol. Tell us how that happened that you were there and if you were ever in any great fear. Well, yes, yeah, so we, we were somehow the only TV crew in the world inside. I have no idea quite how that happened because we just followed the story. We followed the rioters. Um, I, yeah, I, I still don't quite understand now where everyone else was. It's still puzzling to us somewhat, but obviously fantastic that at least we got inside to give a snapshot into what was actually happening. But yeah, in, in terms of any fear or um, anger we faced inside, I would say despite uh, murder the media being scrawled on one of the doors to the Capitol. And as, as we all know, the general distaste for the so-called fake news, we didn't really encounter too much anger once inside because really the fury on that day was not towards the press, it was to those in charge, you know. Um, there, there were a couple of instances when the you know even though we were only operating on us with a small camera the boom mic and robert my correspondent was doing a piece of camera and it, it just draws the eye it draws attention uh on, it, in one instance a group of men did circle us they were wielding these quite heavy wooden sticks a couple of them had spears on top of the sticks that they'd fashioned they demanded to know which news outlet we were from we explained that we were british press we were from ITV News, which they'd never heard of, which helped as well, and um, that we were here just to report on the facts and see why this was happening and listen to them. And then we actually ended up doing a couple of interviews with these guys who were quite threatening afterwards. So I would say while it was quite, there, there were moments that were quite frightening, we would I, I think we managed to kind of steer clear, if not get quite lucky in the we were not targeted more than we were. Sophie, uh, I'm wondering, on your walk from the uh, ellipse to the Capitol, did you notice a mood change among the marchers? 
yeah, uh, great question. That is, that's exactly it. I think the closer we got to the capital, something in the air just changed. Something felt different. I, it's the best way that I can think to describe it. There was a kind of, it wasn't quite a frenzy yet, but there was definitely a charged atmosphere in the air and this, and people seemed to be walking towards the capital with real purpose, you know? Do you think they they felt emboldened as they moved forward without any opposition? Absolutely. And, and as you said, there was no opposition. There were no police stopping them. There were some police once they got to the front of the capital, but essentially they were free to roam and free to do what they like. And let's not forget that the president had just said, let's walk to the Capitol. And I honestly think many of them expected to see him there as well. And that, that emboldened the crowd as well. What kind of offensive paraphernalia did the, uh, the rioters carry with them? What did you see? I didn't see any guns, um, which was perhaps unusual. Um, I saw base, many baseball bats in backpacks, crowbars, sort of iron poles, a lot of these very heavy wooden staffs, spears, which is something I've never seen before in real life. The only time I've seen a spear, I think, is in a museum. Um, and flagpoles, again, but with very sharp fashioned ends. So they were the main weapons and people as well were carrying their own mace their own pepper spray uh, we saw one man with a fire extinguisher spraying what we think he had fashioned into his own mace spray so he was spraying the fire extinguisher at the police but we think inside the fire extinguisher was mace so that, that brings you and to the steps of the Capitol. And the rioters breached the doors easily and you follow them in. What was that like? Well, that's exactly it. I mean, just, just before they breached the doors, um, the rioters got to the inauguration stage and actually got sort of inside the scaffolding. And it was there that there were three doors that enabled them to break onto the terrace and break into the Capitol. But it was actually inside that inauguration stage that was some of, was the most frenzied and charged environment I've ever been in in my entire life. The anger was palpable and it was just sheer determination to break these doors down and get inside. But it, it did appear that some, some of the rioters and some of the mob at least knew where they were, exactly where they were going and where the best entry point was. That was going to be my question, um, Sophie. Did you have any indication that there was inside assistance? I mean, as you just said, they just seemed to know where they were going. Yeah, that's right. Uh, some, of, some of the mob, it did seem, knew where, exactly where to go. And once inside, actually, um, we released a short documentary two nights ago with extra footage from our rushes. Um, there was one woman who really stood out. She was perhaps 30, uh, dressed, dressed in green, a uh, satchel over one shoulder, did not look like she fitted in with the kind of um, every, everyone else inside at all. She, she, you, I would have expected to see her at perhaps a BLM protest. You know, she, she looked, she did not look like the typical kind of right wing rioter at all and she, she was frantically directing the crowds up the stairs and towards the um, office of Nancy Pelosi so that to us indicated that she knew exactly where to direct crowds and that was very interesting. And you did follow them up there and uh, you I, I remember seeing in your piece that you uh, had them holding up her sign that when they ripped that off the wall so you were there then. <clears throat> yeah we saw um, we saw the crowd break the speaker's sign off off the wall, smash it into pieces, and then they shouted over at us. And we thought we were about to, you know, sort of face another, who are you, where are you from? But actually they proudly wanted to pose with the pieces. And that's how we got that great shot of the, um, the man and the woman sort of smiling proudly, holding 
pieces of the speaker's sign. I want to continue more about what, what it was like inside the, the riot, but, but first, before we uh, pick up the narrative there, I want to ask Congressman Rooney, you served in office until January 3rd, three days prior to this, in the, in the weeks, not the days, but in the weeks leading up to this, we saw all kinds of fiery rhetoric. We heard the president repeatedly say the election was, uh, the results were fraudulent. He called on his uh, followers to, to do everything they could, turn over every legal stone. Did you have any indication or did anyone in your caucus have any indication of how bad this really was in terms of the planning for some kind of violent insurrection? Uh, no, Bob, I don't think anybody really expected <clears throat> that they would breach the Capitol in an armed conflict, guns or no guns. Uh, but, th but this exceeded colleague, all expectations. But your colleagues heard the rhetoric. You, you heard Oh, yeah. And, and I think there were a lot of people that were disquieted by the rhetoric. I, rhetoric. I certainly was. And um, these, these people were continually becoming spun up in different parts of the country before they amassed themselves in, in D.C. What would have been the security uh, protocol on a normal day there? Like, I've been in and out of the Capitol hundreds of yeah. times. I went through checkpoints. There were always lots of cops. There are lots of cops, but they can't do a whole lot. They're, they're at all the magnetometers and the entries and all that, but they don't have nearly the horsepower to stop a big armed mob like might like hit them. They're not trained for it, don't have enough people, and they don't have a security barrier further enough away to break it down. I mean, the part of the thing about security, at least in the diplomatic area that I'm familiar with, is how far away do you stop them? And they're not equipped to stop anybody till they're right on their on their heels. That's going to change now. I think we're going to be just as much of an armed camp at the Capitol as we are around the White House now. Well, I'm going to bring in uh, Grace Seegers, and also I see her colleague Zach uh, Hudick from CBS has joined us. Zach, welcome to you. But Grace, first for you, you were in the Senate chamber. Yes, I was. So you're you're watching this procedure go on as they're trying to uh, essentially count the electoral vote. Tell me what's the first sign you had inside that something was wrong because you had a different vantage point than Sophie did. Yeah, so the really interesting thing for me has been learning how much danger that I and the senators and the vice president were in at the time and we just had no idea. So the rioters literally came within seconds of entering the chamber before Pence had left um, and before fortunately a Capitol Police officer was able to direct them away and that allowed for the reporters and the senators themselves to be locked into the chamber. So really we had no idea that anything was going on. I had seen on Twitter that the um, Cannon House office building was being evacuated but that was on the other side of the Capitol so I didn't really know that anything was happening on the Senate side as well. And then all of a sudden, uh, Pence was evacuated from the chamber. Did and I thought to surprised? myself- Was he surprised by that? Did, did he look shocked when they came to move him out? No, um, he looked pretty normal. It, I think what he thought and what I thought at the time was, this seems like they're just taking precautions. There isn't any immediate danger, but there might be over on the House side, so we'll get the Vice President out of here. Um, and then we realized something was wrong, uh, really wrong, when we were told to all get in the chamber and have the doors locked behind us. Well, I heard that uh, the reporters and correspondents were almost left behind. Uh, that That's they did true. get the senators out, um, but you all were still there for, for a little bit. Yes, that's true. So uh, we were in the chamber for about half an hour. Um, and then all of a sudden the senators started being evacuated and there was a rush to the door. Um, and one of the Senate gallery staffers shouted down to the Capitol Police officers, what about us? We're up here, what should we do? Um, I do think that they had forgotten about us since we were on the balcony overlooking the chamber floor. Um, so very grateful to that staffer because literally moments later, protesters were inside the chamber. Um, and if we had been there at the time, um, 
who knows what could have happened. So it, it was a very close call and I didn't even realize it at the time. And Zach, you were, Zach Kudak's with us now from CBS. You were on the house side. And I know you took some video later of, of the, the cops and the security people with guns at the door. Tell me, tell me what that was like. Um, at the, excuse me, at the early stages, uh, I don't know what it had been about 1.30 in the afternoon um, when we started seeing Twitter chatter um, that the Capitol had been breached. I think I and most of the people in the room um, felt like we were in probably the safest place on the hill that we could be um, or tied with the Senate chamber. Um, and like pretty shortly after that, we went on lockdown in there. And I think everyone still had really tremendous confidence because we were, you know, in the room that we lock our um, elected officials in. Um, and then I would say about 2.15, um, everybody was told to take gas masks from under their um, chairs. Um, they passed them out to the press. They were under the members' chairs on the floor. Um, and I think at that point, uh, everyone started getting a little bit concerned. Um, that, that was because they had used tear gas in the rotunda. Um, and then pretty shortly after there, uh, you saw them start taking leadership out. I think I saw them take uh, Hoyer out first, um, but I couldn't quite see Pelosi from where I was sitting. Um, and kind of like Grace was saying on the Senate side, um, the press and any members who were sitting in the gallery were really the last to go at the um, late stages. We kind of had to climb out, climb out of the press gallery and then we're slowly um, evacuating, but there's a bottleneck. Um, and at the doors, that's the point when uh, we saw um, security guards, or I guess they're Capitol Police um, for the floor take out their uh, firearms, uh, handguns, and point them at the door. And they were holding up a you know, large sort of antique looking wooden chest um, to keep the door shut while on the other side, the rioters were, I don't know, banging it, you know, it sounded as though they were like battering, taking a battering ram to it, but they may have just been shouldering into it. Um, and in those kind of last couple minutes while we were still in there, we heard what I'm pretty sure was the gunshot go off. Um, the timing matches up. Um, and I mean, it could have been something else, but I'm pretty sure it was the gunshot. Um, and at that point, like everybody kind of hit the ground um, to stay out uh, of the way if anything happened. Um, but then we got taken out and pretty quickly um, we're taken to safety. Uh, but I think what was really remar remarkable for me and everyone else in there and I walked to work. Um, I walked past all these, um, at that time, I guess, just protesters. Uh, no riots broken out. Um, and I had no concerns. I was like, you know, I'm in, I'm in the Capitol. Um, and I, I think, like, for me and for Grace, like, the last couple of days, it's been really kind of a reckoning of, like, how unsafe we might actually have been um, I think, at least speaking for myself, I had, like, unrealistic um, faith in the security or even that day I mean even as like guns were drawn I was like yeah you know we're in the capital like we're, we're, we're safe um and in retrospect I, I mean I think we were safe-ish but not not incredibly safe right but Congressman Rooney um were you hearing from any of your former colleagues when the when this was all happening or did you talk to them then after or but was anybody in touch during not during, just after. I, I think it was such a scramble, as the, the reporters have said. Everybody was kind of, uh, everyone for themselves, trying to figure out where to go and where to hide and what to do. But um, but after? After, yeah. There's a lot of people that were very afraid, as they should have been. Um, but not enough remorse about what happened, to be honest with you, Denise. Out of our team, I would have liked to have heard a little more worse about the people that did this. Hey, Congressman, this is Bob Orr. On that point, one of the things that just astonished me was after we witnessed, and, and the world watched this play out on television, after we witnessed this riot, then they re-gaveled in the House and the Senate. They were going about their business. And to my astonishment, frankly, 
there were dozens of Republicans in the House and I think eight senator Republicans in the Senate who, who continued to push forward with this idea of not certifying the votes. What were you thinking? I thought it was amazing. I, I think it's absolute lunacy. I'm so glad to see the major corporations in the country, most of those CEOs are friends of mine, uh, say they're not going to give any money to anybody that, that would not vote, that voted against the certification of the election. That's basically undermining our democracy. It's never happened before. No matter how much John Adams detested Thomas Jefferson, he accepted the result. Same with John Quincy Adams and Andrew Jackson. This has never happened before, and I think it's highly destabilizing. But there's still not across the board remorse. I mean, no, there's not enough. There should no. be a, there should be some remorse. We saw an impeachment vote yesterday, and I think ten Republican House members voted to to forward the impeachment article to the Senate. What is your reaction to that? Well, <laughs> I wish I'd have been there to add to that, but I wasn't. But uh, I, I I think Liz is super strong, and I appreciate her leadership, and uh, John Katko and the rest of them. And, uh, but I, I can't answer for the 129, 30, 40 that continue to put their head in the sand and want to propagate a lie. You know, there's that old thing in statecraft of authoritarian rulers, that doctrine that if you tell a lie often enough, people will believe it. You know, it's worked for Chavez, it worked for Ceausescu, it worked for Lenin, worked for Hitler. Uh, these are bad things and these are all lies and they need to be debunked. In your opinion, in your opinion now, should the Senate vote to convict the president? I could argue both sides of that. I think if they have the votes, they might as well. But if they don't have the votes, they shouldn't bring it up and have a loss. And uh, there's one argument that says impeaching him now. Well, first of all, I don't think they should impeach him if they can't get it done while, while he's still in office. I, I don't know what that ex out of office impeachment thing looks like. That's kind of like, uh, a duck in a goose's body to me. But, but, but if they can impeach him while he's there, I could see a strong argument for doing it. If they can't, there is the argument, let things ride and don't make anything any more divisive than it needs to be. That's kind of Rubio's argument. Uh, I don't know. I think the people are going to have to sort all that out over time. Let's um, get back. Uh, let's get back to Sophie Alexander. Larry, I'm going to turn it back to you because I know we want to pick up Sophie's narrative when we left her last, she was outside the speaker's office and had ripped a sign off the door. So I guess what I'd like to know, Sophie, at that point, were you wondering how far is this going to go? I mean, are we going to see hostages taken? Are we going to see Congress people hurt? I mean, what are you thinking when you see this? Because it seems no bounds. There's no bounds for these protesters. Yeah, I truthfully, I had absolutely no idea. Um, how far this was going to go. And truthfully, while safety w was on that day was my first priority, I was also kind of just, it was quite hard to think ahead because it was so unpredictable. I, I've never seen anything like that. Robert, my correspondent who's worked in news for many, many years, has never seen or witnessed anything like that. And I think we, we were just kind of taking almost each second as it happened because there were, we couldn't have predicted we we couldn't have predicted how this was going to go what was going to happen next it was completely new completely unpredictable so we were just I was just conscious that I had to keep the team safe and we wanted to keep rolling. Sophie inside the building did you get the impression that the crowd was hunting? Did they have specific personalities and targets they were looking for? There were chants before the crowd even got to Pelosi's office of Nancy, Nancy, where are you, Nancy? I mean, as we know, Pelosi is a hate figure for many on the right, but it seemed to me Pelosi was absolutely a target but murmurings as we were going inside as well once the crowd realized that Mike Pence was not able to kind of overturn the election you know which he never had the power to do anyway um, the crowds I just heard murmurings of the crowd starting to say you know 
where where's Pence? We need to get to him. Where's Pence? He is the power to change this. We need to get to Pence. Uh, Congressman, uh, can I ask you to change from uh, your legislative experience to your ambassadorial role? Um, how did the events of January 6th uh, impact the selling of American-style democracy overseas? Well, that's kind of what I mentioned earlier. I, I think we've got some serious work to do to rebuild our, our, our position in the world for a variety of reasons preceding that. But the world looks at us as a, as a beacon of stability, uh, transparency, democracy. And I, I don't know how we can make those arguments when we're a lockdown uh, when we're in a total lockdown situation. I mean, there's more security around the White House and the Capitol right now than there is in around Miraflores Palace in Caracas, than there is in uh, La Paz, Bolivia. And th this is highly unusual. And what, what picture does that present to the world about America and their, their country's hopes for freedom and democracy? Of so. Yeah, it's not good. And, Grace, uh, Grace Seegers, I'm going to need you to unmute your mic, Grace. Uh, what are you hearing now about the security risk going forward? Because there's still more business to do. The inauguration's coming up. Washington looks like an armed camp. What are you hearing? We see all these FBI bulletins, all these warnings of other potential threats. What are you hearing inside? So I think that the inauguration is going to be as secure as it can be. Um, yesterday, I was at the Capitol on the House side to report on the impeachment vote, as was Zach. And uh, it was really crazy to walk into the Capitol Visitor Center, which is usually filled with tourists, and see hundreds of National Guardsmen napping on the floor, cradling their guns because they had just finished an overnight shift uh, protecting the Capitol. And we heard that uh, there was a very high threat level yesterday, um, but didn't actually see any protests um, or riots. Um, I felt as secure as one can be, with, surrounded by thousands of guardsmen. Um, and I walked to work. I live about 20 minutes away. And on my walk back, uh, back home, they had put up these eight foot fences um, several blocks away from the Capitol, um, just a kind of a perimeter squaring off the entire complex plus a few blocks. And I actually had a hard time getting out of the uh, perimeter um, because there were so many fences and so little entrances that I, I didn't know how to leave. Um, so what I'm hearing about security going forward is that the city is going to be extremely militarized and we probably can expect more demonstrations in the coming days, but it'll be a lot harder for them to get even close to the Capitol. And, and Zach, I was wondering real quickly, uh, I was wondering, do you wear your press badge when you're walking outside now by yourself to and from the building? I wear it uh, when I'm near the perimeter and I wore it when there was a curfew, um, but I've uh, kept it like very much within my coat once I'm kind of away from uh, uh, Capitol Police and National Guard and stuff, honestly, because I, I don't want to be accosted by um, any remaining, you know, protesters or rioters. Uh, the, the morning of the 6th, uh, somebody saw my press badge and my mask and was like yelling at me on the way to the Capitol. So when I'm here, I have it out as visible as possible. But once I'm out of here, I'm kind of keeping it hidden, truthfully. I mean, the president has spent uh, years calling the press, among other things, the enemy of the people. Uh, I mean, do you feel like there are people that take that so to heart that you really are their perceived enemy? I think... Uh, I think there are, but I also, uh, right before starting this job on the Capitol was, uh, on the Hill was covering uh, the election from Pennsylvania and went to, I think every one of the Trump rallies Trump had there for like a four month period, which was pretty much every week or more for a while. Um, and I'd be running around getting MOS with 
uh, their supporters. And like some of them would kind of yell at us and stuff. But truthfully, really, really a lot of people would be very skeptical of like even just CBS News. And then we'd start talking to them. And they would really open up and like be like, what channel can we go watch this on? So I think like I, I, I do think there is pollution in the perception of the press due to the president. But I, I think that we still I, I, I think it is salvageable. Um, and I think I saw it being salvageable at all those Trump rallies. And, and also, you know, Grace, although, uh, uh, I'm sorry, Sophie, uh, is British, you know, they didn't know that immediately. And if, and if it was uh, going to be an attack, it would have been there with them coming in with you. Yeah, absolutely. And I think it's worth saying at this stage that we did hear mutterings about people talking about CNN, which is a hate figure. I think CNN is hated by the right wing extremists more than any other, which is obviously just, well, incredibly sad among other things. But I think had we been CNN, maybe things would have been slightly different. Um, but like I said, while we were targeted by a few people who were carrying weapons, we were we did manage to talk our way out of it and I, I maybe that was a maybe that was luck maybe we were targeted by people who weren't really that interested in um punishing the press that day they were looking to punish others perhaps if it had been other people who were more ardent in their hatred about the press things might have been different but well i'm glad to say we managed to get out of it uh safely and how did you get out i mean so you just started leaving when they all started to leave well, we were in the rotunda, the three of us, uh, myself, Robert, and cameraman Mark Davey. And we looked at our watch and realised that if we wanted to package this for our News at 10 programme in the UK, Robert had to leave immediately. So Robert left. I told him to message us as soon as he was safely out. And he ran back to the Bureau and started working with our editor, Adam, to get this on the air, Mark, the cameraman and I stayed in the rotunda, just gathering, just trying to get faces, detail, you know, the badges on people's bags, the flags they were carrying, the, the markings on their hats, just, just trying to gather and take it all in and just get that atmosphere and hope to, you know, put that on air. Finally, the National Guard showed up it really they really took a long time because until then the crowd had just been free to do what they want the police had absolutely no chance of stopping them and weren't trying to and i don't blame them because they would have pr probably been killed um but when the national guard showed up they formed a line and we were pushed to the ground and essentially just forced out of the rotunda at which time we looked at our phones and our watches again and realized that we had some excellent new footage and we just managed to force our way outside and ran back to the bureau. One of the questions that uh, is going to go on for a long time is how much pre-planning, if there was pre-planning, how much of this was a conspiracy. I'd like to ask the congressman, there's a, a movement now on the Hill among some Democrats who are saying they saw tours being conducted, unusual amount of tours being conducted on January 5th. The Capitol has been closed largely to visitors since March. Do you make anything of that? And do you think that is a thread that should be thoroughly investigated? Well, definitely it should be investigated. I read what Mickey Sherrill put out that, that she'd seen some staffers escorting constituents, if you will, around. I don't know if they, if some of these people infiltrated the offices under false pretense or whether there was a conspiracy on the part of some of the Freedom Caucus type of people to escort them around, but that would, take this thing to a whole new level of insurrection if elected officials and their staffs were aiding and abetting these, uh, the, these uh, assault, this assault on the Capitol. The other thing I've heard is that a couple of the Capitol Police were kind of uh, uh, sympathizers with the protesters, which is also just, disquieting. You just don't dismiss this out of hand. You're saying- No, this not at all. I think needs to be, everything in this out. deal needs to be run to ground. This is an incredibly big deal that our capital was breached. Incredibly big deal that these people have been spun up all around the country to commit violence and mayhem. And it needs to be run to ground. 
I want to take a few minutes as we get close to the end uh, to allow some other folks to ask some questions. So if you have a question, uh, raise your hand and then unmute your mic. And then as soon as you're, uh, you're done with the question, if you can mute again, uh, David Silverberg, uh, go ahead. Okay, can you hear me? And please, and please identify yourself too. Okay, my name is David Silverberg. I was a former uh, Capitol Hill reporter um, with the Hill. Um, and my, my question is to the reporters who were there on the ground. Now, what I'm doing now is looking at the accounts of this event that have been brought back by local activists who were there. So one local activist who is very prominent, his name is Alfie Oaks is saying that the following things, that the people who entered the Capitol were paid actors, that they were Antifa, that these were a agent provocateurs. Um, and this is sort of the myth-making that's going around here. So my question to all the reporters who were there, did you see any evidence of this kind of uh, conspiracy that these people were in disguise? that they were Antifa, that they were paid actors, that they uh, provoked the crowd in a way that it wouldn't otherwise have been provoked. And my other question is, uh, has to do with the numbers of people who were there, because <clears throat> Mr. Oaks is saying there were uh, one and a half to two million people. Um, and I know that I believe the Capitol Police have now said that there were perhaps 8,000 rioters. So those are the two questions. Did you see any disguised provocation and what were the numbers you would give it? Thank you. Um, well, just speaking for myself, um, I've also been seeing those uh, claims and frankly, they're absolutely ridiculous. The idea that Antifa somehow infiltrated the group um, there is absolutely no evidence of that. We have seen people on the ground at the time saying they were doing what they were doing to support the president. Some even said that they were doing this uh, because they heard what the president said and came to the Capitol at what they believed was his urging. Um, they were wearing MAGA hats. I mean, the evidence, all evidence points to this being a mob of Trump supporters and the idea of Antifa infiltrators, I think is really insidious because it allows people to uh, kind of cast off responsibility instead of taking an honest look at uh, members of their party who might be willing to go to extremes. And just on that note, something I will note is that a lot of these people weren't uh, militia members or hardcore extremists. A lot of them were normal people, teachers and firefighters who came to the Capitol because they seriously believed that a grievance was being done and that violence was a corrective. So I do think that there needs to be a hard and honest look at how these people were radicalized and what this means for the future of President Trump supporters and the Republican Party. You know, and, and just Bob, if I could, if I could um, ask the Congressman, I know that you're, you're a lifelong conservative Republican. I've heard you say you've never voted outside the party. Let you, you have reached a conclusion about the president. How do you explain the loyalties of these people? Well, he, he clearly tapped into something that none of us realized uh, the depth of, of the resentment and alienation and the, 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 the antipathy to the so-called global elites and the uh, demographic changes that, have, that, have, uh, that are present in our country and are going to be here. And he's leveraged that into a culture of hate. And I think we have a lot of work to do to figure out where we go as a Republican Party. The Republican Party used to stand for a free enterprise, lower taxes, supporting business solutions instead of government solutions, uh, and willing, willingness to work together with the Democrats in things like foreign policy and, and common goals. And we don't have any of that right now. Uh, Jeff Margolis, I saw that you had a question. If you would unmute your mic, ask your question and identify yourself, please. Thanks, Bob. Uh, I'm Jeff Margolis, a member of the Press Club of uh, Southwest Florida. And I have a question for Sophie. Um, based on the information you provided in the video that your crew has, is any of that material 
do you think uh, of use to the FBI? Hi. Um, yeah, they're, they're going to use the footage that is already ready, readily available, the seven minute long package that was put out on our program. But anything else they require, if they want our full rushes, they're going to have to subpoena us. That's our legal position. Uh, okay, Rick, and will Rick, you give that? And will you give that willingly? Or you probably well, don't know that. But what are you hearing? No. Um, so obviously, this goes way above my my little pay grade. Um, but no, we're we're not willingly giving up our rushes. We. We're not willingly giving up our rushes. We are going to wait. And if we're subpoenaed and we have to give them up, then we will. Uh, Rick Pullen, I think you had a question. If you would unmute your microphone and ask your question, and identify yourself, please. Yeah, I'm Rick Pullen. I, I used to cover Capitol Hill 20 years ago. So I'm back and forth between Washington and Florida. I want to ask all of you, what, what does this mean for conservative media? Um, you know, they call themselves reporters. They call them, so, you know, uh, I'm thinking of Fox News, but now it's even gone further to the right. And, you know, especially Congressman, I'd really like your, your view on this, but the other reporter, but the reporters too, just how do you deal with, you know, I mean, they've been promoting a lot of these ideas that Trump's been putting out, especially the lies, especially since election day. Congressman? Well, I, I think we need to... Uh turn a new page after next week. And we need to uh, somehow or another figure out who believes in the traditional Republican party, which is an in the, in the hash marks group and who doesn't, which is an out of the hash marks group that's doing all these things. And I don't think there's any quarter to have between the two. But what do you think of conservative media? You think they played uh, a role? You know, I, I've been writing a lot about how do we fix the problems that we have right now, partisanship and all that? And I think three simple things would be really helpful if we could somehow do it. Term limits, return of the fairness doctrine so that we can defang the, the partisan media on both sides and, and then redistricting balanced districts so that the election that takes place is the general, not the primary. If we could do those three things, I think we would move the ball from the 10 to the 50. Do you think the fairness doctrine should uh, uh, relate to social media? Absolutely. Like Facebook. In fact, I, I was working with David Cicilline while I was still there that I think we need to treat them as content providers, just like under New York Times v. Sullivan and all those other lines of casework. They're like, to me, they're like TV or newspaper. They can't sit there and say, I'm just a pipeline. You know, whatever goes through it, we have, we have no accountability for it. That's not right. All right, and the others, I'd like the others if they could comment on that. Uh, well, it, quickly, I'd like to move along if we could. Does anyone else have a comment on that question? Uh, we're going we're gonna to move along then. Thank you, Rick. Uh, I know Robbie Spencer had a question. Robbie, are you there? Yeah, sorry. I, uh, I'm driving, so uh, my video is off. But, um, I, I used to be the editor of a local paper in, in Naples, obviously Florida Weekly, and I freelance for a number of publications, including The Times. But, and I, I just want to say, I think it's one thing to be a foreign correspondent and being in these types of situations, but I'm curious if any of the reporters have any thoughts on like how you feel after being a part of this experience. Like, have you done any soul searching regarding, you know, your profession? Um, just like, how do you feel, how are you feeling after being a part of this experience regarding your job and, and just being there and witnessing this? Anybody? Um, um, yeah, I can... I can jump. Oh, <laughs> no, you go ahead, Sophie. Sure. Um, it's obviously been quite overwhelming. Um, I'm not actually a, necessarily a foreign news producer. I'm sort of just an all round producer. I've only been living and working in DC for a year, exactly one year to the day of when the insurrection happened, actually. So, yeah, I mean, it, it's a lot to take in, but it did absolutely affirm my belief in what we do and why we do it. Because had myself, Robert and Mark not gone inside with rioters that day, we would only be left with 
social kind of very blurry social media footage from the rioters to kind of base events on but actually our report gives an exact not just a snapshot but a real insight into what people were thinking and why they did it and I think that's ultimately why we do what we do is to just tell the story of other people and I think that my belief in what I do has completely been affirmed now. Um, I would agree with Sophie in that I believe our profession is very important and my belief in it has been affirmed. I mean, it's obviously disturbing to have your place of work be the site of a domestic terror attack. Um, but I know that my reporting and Zach's reporting on the House side was really critical to CBS on that day. We were able to send dispatches about what was happening when no one knew what was happening outside of the building. And we were able to help get that information out, not only for our network, um, but also for people just watching along on social media um, and for people who were watching the CBS special coverage of it. I did a phone interview while sitting on the floor of a safe location about everything that was happening. So I do think it's very important um, to have people on the ground and to have journalists uh, recording history because especially last Wednesday, I believe it was a historic event that needed to be recorded. So I think uh, we're, we're close to wanting to wrap this up. Uh, Larry, do you have any last points you'd like to get in here with our uh, journalists? Not real points, but congratulations to our journalists for a job well done under extraordinary circumstances as they witnessed one of the darkest chapters in this nation's history. And I'd like to ask Grace and Zach and uh, Sophie, got any plans for Inauguration Day? Be safe. <laughs> Thanks very much. Thank you. Denise, any last uh, any last thoughts you'd like to share? No, I think uh, Larry said it all. <laughs> well, our thanks, uh, of course, to uh, Congressman Rooney for spending so much time with us today, and all of our journalists, uh, Zach, Sophie, and Grace. Uh, you were courageous in the line of duty, and that makes uh, all of us very, very proud. Uh, please stay safe. Also, thanks to our media partners, ITV, CBS News, AP, and other uh, sources of video and pictures. And I'd like to thank uh, all of our Press Club folks for participating, and thanks to you for watching. By the way, if you're watching this uh, later on our Facebook page or YouTube, please remember to uh, like us and please subscribe to our YouTube channel. So thanks again for joining Roundtable. I'm Bob Orr, and we will see you next time.